what we're going to be talking about today is the modern workforce is becoming increasingly older. And if you're not aware of this right now, particularly in healthcare, we actually have at least four and pretty soon we will have five different generations of age brackets working in healthcare. So back in 2016, Morgan Anderson looked at this <clears throat> and we have people looking at this as far back as 10 to 12 years ago, but lately because of the personalities, the culture, the work styles, all of it and intergener intergenerational interactions, there seems to be minor collisions and microaggressions. So we have to be aware of that, how it interplays within the workplace. They can be described negatively and they can be very exaggerated when they're housed in a workplace setting. That lens of communication and they look at is the accommodation theory. And people will often say in the workplace, we will, <clears throat> or this will be done a certain way. And as we age and we bring the younger people into the workforce, we have to take a look at how we interact with each other. So what we're going to do with some of this, I want you to take a look at your work. I want you to think about now what made you choose this type of work that you, you chose, what profession? How did you learn? That's a key question when you're looking at all of this. How did you actually learn how to be the profession you are? Is the learning taking place today different from how you learned? Which I will tell you right now, it's vastly different. Just being on this, this <coughs> excuse me, type of webinar is very different. Would you choose the role that you're in, the profession that you're in? Would you do it again if given the chance? Would you be able to learn the way they're learning today? Now I have all different professions um, and I teach right now at the advanced graduate level in different uh, schools. And what I find is they're incredibly resilient and they learn very quickly as opposed to the type of learning that I learned. So that being said, there's a real appreciation for me on how they learn. Now, I love this quote, so I always try to use it. <clears throat> go into the world and do well. But more importantly, go into the world and do good. Now, that's who we are. No matter what profession in healthcare you're in, we are charged with, within our profession, to do good. And uh, that's our belief system. It's inherent in who we are. So in the intergenerational issues, what you're looking at today is today's workplace, <clears throat> as I said before, has at least four and often five. And from those generations, you wanna take a look at the birth timing. And, and I'll show you that in a couple of different graphs. And they are now working side by side. Each of those different age brackets has its own needs and their own expectations, their own styles, their own communication. Healthcare now is very different from four years ago. It often views staff personnel now as commodities, and we need to fill those designated slots and staffing grids. So it's different from how people thought if you grew up in the 60s, 70s, 80s, where you became the professional in order to do good. <clears throat> so there's a commoditization of the workforce that causes collisions in the priorities of managers. Managers are, their priority is to fill the slots, to make sure that there's um, the priority of staffing, fill vacancies. Essential leadership competencies now include enhanced skills in communications, conflict resolution, diversity, creating a vision, motivating and inspiring staff at all levels. Now this is new for managers. And those of you that are watching this that are here with me, and you're a manager, I just want you to think about the role that you have. Because in my world, and I've had positions at all levels, including executive management, there is no more difficult position than middle management because they have to work with the staff that they provide supervision to, and then they're answerable 
to the administrative and executive level. So very often they have to complete all of these areas that you're looking at right here and in turn deal with all the generational issues of the stress of the staffing. Now, <clears throat> keep in mind here, and I love this sort of picture here, because success is interdependent, really, on the collaboration of all employees. For those of you that are in the workplace now, think about what it's like when you have one negative employee. The impact that that one person has. Another issue is when one person who's a key person, and in my belief system, all are key, but when one person calls in sick, what happens to the points here in all of this diagram? They can shift. And now the points shift to sort of all one side, all to one point, or where does the workload get distributed? And then how the workload is distributed not only changes how it interacts, but then the workload themselves or the workload itself with the people based on their type of work and how they function based on their age, which seems incongruous, but you'll see in a minute when I show you some of the graphs. Helping professions. Now, this is who you are. No matter who you are in any helping profession, you are self-sacrificing, you're often confronted with dangerous situations. <clears throat> Excuse me, we are known for working till it hurts. We skip breaks, we will work late at their own cost. This is very particular to what's called the older traditionalist workers or the soldiers. Having trouble slowing down, we can get into blaming others. We have difficult work. A lot of people outside of healthcare may not understand what you do, but it's very difficult work depending on which profession you are, whether you're a, um, a psychology-based profession, a helping-based profession, or a medical-based profession. You have different kinds of supervision, and not only do you have different types, you think differently about the word alone. Delegation may be difficult for you, and you often, no matter what profession you're in, you may need to rotate to different facilities, floors, agencies, buildings, etc. That alone, just all of this that you're looking at can cause stress in of itself, let alone how you learned, let alone your age bracket, and let alone your belief system. So sometimes the system that we work in looks like this, or it can feel like this, which means it's jumping. So what I'm told today may be different tomorrow. Or because the system is evolutionary and ever constant and ever-changing, it never feels to many people who have learned a very different way, where stability was key, they may not feel that the system is ever stable. Whereas if you have younger workers, who are now called, and this is, I feel, a bit of a pejorative term, but younger workers may be more flexible with this and have less trouble adjusting to a constantly shifting system. So <clears throat> whatever system you're in, everyone has to measure success. Everyone measures success. So what do you do? How do you measure it? We look at outcome data. We look at patient improvement, the number of people served, cost containment. Budget is always a key issue. Area positions retained, people retained. Somewhere down the road here in one of the slides, it says the average length of time that new employees stay because the, the, the market is changing for, based on the age bracket is 4.4 years. I just want you to think about that for a minute. Look at the time it takes to orient someone. Look at the time and money it takes to mentor someone. As opposed to say 30, 40 years ago when someone entered a position, and I mean the workforce, not just healthcare. They entered the workforce with the belief system that they would stay in that position till they, what, retired. That's no longer the, the issue today. That's no longer the belief system today. It's very, very different. So people will switch positions, switch jobs, facilities, agencies, 
based on needs or personal preference. <clears throat> so now, especially in healthcare, when you have therapy-based professionals, people tend to measure success by how they feel. What does that mean? It means in healthcare, when I look at a report and I look at numbers and it, budget containment and positions retained and positions lost, et cetera, those are numbers. But when I talk to a person about how they measure success, that person, if they feel good about teaching that patient, client, consumer, guest resident, that person is able to maintain sobriety, whether they're on medications, whether they're on 12 step, whether they're on a blended program, whatever. That to us may be in the world of addictive substance abuse disorders. That's success for us. We don't look at numbers, so to speak. But even in the workforce, if they look at financial reports, if I feel good about what I did based on the interaction with the client, with the financial client, then I feel good because I am measuring success with that indicator. And that really is you want to just take a look at that as part of the human experience. This is very often, and I, I sort of giggled when I saw this because <clears throat> very often it's how we feel based on your age about a reorganization chart. So when someone in the team leadership meeting, or you have a team meeting, or a, a unit meeting, managers meeting, etc., and they share that there's going to be reorganization in the system, people again will feel like the floor is shifting, that there isn't stability like there used to be. And we have to keep in mind now that all sy systems are moving and systems are ever evolving. But based on your age bracket, you will look at this and you will agree with it. Or if you're younger and you're new to the workforce and you have a different belief system, this isn't the priority that it is for a person with a different belief um, in how things should work. So Workplace 2020, here's what you're looking at. So traditionalists are people, now I also wanna back up here for a minute and tell you that these numbers are fluid. So it says traditionalists are born prior to 1946. That can be a fluid number. <clears throat> so in other words, somebody can be born in 1948, but maintain a lot of the, sort of the priority belief systems of what's called a traditionalist, also called a soldier. The baby boomers are the next generation. Again, numbers are a bit fluid here. Generation X, born between 65 to 76. Millennials are the newer group and the people coming into the workforce, generation 2020, born after 1997. Then there's generation Y, W-H-Y is what it really means is because those people ask and question everything. So it's interesting how people get labeled. I, I'm not a fan of labels. I do find labels pejorative. But when you looked at this, when you read all the research on this, it really makes sense when you're studying and you think of people you know that you work with or in your life in general. Intergenerational work styles. Now the question is always, does when you were born influence how you communicate at work? Your generation, based on what we just talked about here, will influence this. It determines your work ethic, your work values. It becomes your point of reference in how you see the world, actually. And your world is your work very often. I mean, we spend a lot of time at work. <coughs> Excuse me. It also influences your communication style. And some of this, we'll go over it, so I'm not just giving you these terms. It impacts your language and your vocabulary also. Your communication variations. Interpersonal ways were different are the intergenerational influences, your work styles, how you communicate to people, and why is this so important? It's important because of how you recruit people and you retain them. Now remember that statistic that people stay on the average of 4.4 years. One of the things 
any good manager in business would like to do is keep people, retain them. You don't want to lose good, solid employees just because their age bracket is different and they think different. If we mentor them, we will encourage them to stay in the system. You also want to promote safety and satisfaction with all age brackets. Now this is a slide that really talks about, if you look over here, it says generation, and these are intergenerational issues. The broad traits of that group, and then the defining technology intervention, which is somewhat humorous here. The traditionalists also can be called soldiers. Their overriding trait is loyalty. Now these are the people that stayed at a job for 30 to 40 years. They believe solidly in sacrifice, loyalty, discipline, and have great respect for authority. So their technology invention, what they prided themselves on, was learning how to use a fax machine. Baby boomers, which came after traditionalists, so these are essentially the children of your traditionalists. They are known for competition. They are very competitive. So their traits are they're competitive, they believe in hard work, they will work long hours. And they first learned how to use a personal computer. It was huge, it might have been the size of a wall, but they first learned and they pride themselves on that. And when this crowd doesn't know how to do something or how to use a piece of technology, they will go find out from whom? Very often from their grandchildren because they are extremely competitive and do not want to be left behind. Generation X, <clears throat> again, sort of the 40s age bracket. Again, numbers are fluid. Their trait is they are extremely self-reliant. They are very eclectic. They can do lots of different things all at once. They are extremely self-reliant, free agents, and have a, a lot of work-life balance. Their <laughs> defining intervention is a mobile phone. Now, the original mobile phones, if you remember them, were quite large. They were as big as a shoe. But they first learned how to use it. The millennials today, the word millennial is very pejorative. So immediately in the workplace, when someone says they are a millennial or they are described as a millennial, they're viewed as not really fully understanding the global picture. The trait of a millennial is they are immediate. They are the least racist, the least bigoted, and the most community service oriented crowd of all that you're looking at here. They believe strongly in diversity and they are very confident. Now their defining intervention, they have Google and Facebook. They are very skilled in anything that remotely speaks to the internet. Generation 2020, which is coming up, they are hyper-connected. They are very mobile. They are media savvy. They have their lifeline to online work starts in preschool. Take a look at young children today. They do not even need directions. They are able to sit on a computer and maneuver through it. Now, this crowd can use iPhone and apps, and they are very fluid with any form of technology. Technology. The work styles. So soldiers, called traditionalists, again, these numbers, fluid, also known as radio babies. The boomers, baby boomers, are called boomers. The nexters, Generation X, are called Generation X. Generation Y um, is really coming up with what's coming, but some researchers label them as Y because they question everything. Generation one or I is for being invisible because these, and I'll show you in a later slide, these kids and Generation L essentially grew themselves up. And the reason for that is the boomers were the first ones that had the women going strongly back to work. So the baby boomer women were the, the mothers that left the home and went out to work. So the next years of the Generation X kids were essentially learning quickly how to be self-reliant, which then became 
one of their dominant features. Millennials, also called Generation.com, Generation Y for Y. Five generations in the workplace. Well, here you have, look at them listed here by color. And over here by 2020, you see the Generation Y coming into the workforce. The millennials will be the largest and the, the very light blue is the traditionalists. So by 2020, you will have very few traditionalists left in the workplace, but you will always have some because people in that age bracket are loyal and believe in sacrifice and discipline. You also have people that enjoy the workforce, getting up, having a purpose in life and going to work. Soldiers, <clears throat> the traditionalists, are called the greatest generation. They came of age, depending on their age, during World War II. They have very strong ties to family and community. They believe in civic pride, loyalty, respect for authority. This is the group that saved their money, they paid cash, and they traded up. They were informed by radio and newspapers. Now, what it means to be traded up is this group learned that they should have more than their parents. So they believed in buying a house. They believed in getting a, a car. So everything should go upwards. I learn by learning from my parents what I need to do in life is to increase. So some of the people here made sure that they sent their kids to school. Soldiers grew up, what they learned is Beep Up, Bobby Sox, Rosie the Riveter. I mean, this is their frame of reference for the social interaction for them. Soldiers at work, and many are still employed in healthcare. They like consistency, they like uniformity, they like tradition, they are very solid, no nonsense performers. They believe in logic, not magic. They have great respect for authority. When the manager says do this, they follow rules. They do what is told to them. Now, do they grumble? Possibly. But still in all, this is what the boss, the manager said, so we do it. They expect law and order at work. That's what their belief system is. There are rules to be followed and we don't break them. Work was hard and they always did their work with very minimal technology. Baby boomers now, the me generation. This is the crowd that rebelled against authority. So this group, you have to, if you are not old enough, when you go back and you look at this group, they initially started rebelling against authority. A lot of it had to do with that time framework of Vietnam. So they began rebelliousness, rebellious behavior. They questioned authority. They promoted equality and social justice. It's still a very strong belief system in this age bracket. They were raised to expect a greater standard of living from their parents. So this group still believes they should achieve more. They, back then, were taught to fight the war on poverty, oppression, and the man. They searched their soul and they sought personal gratification. So they were the original, what feels, what do I feel? Now this crowd still believes that they're cool. In <laughs> this sage bracket, you still see this going on. They are still, you know, having concerts, etc., even though they're in their late 60s. Baby boomers grew up with fallout shelters, hula hoop, laugh-in. There's certain social issues to each group. Boomers at work now, they're different. They have a lot of energy. Remember, they're competitive. They're enthusiastic, and they become engrossed in causes. They believe in growth and expansion. So this is the group that has to have more. They have to achieve more than what their parents had. They are not naturally budget-minded. Now, I want you to think about that because if they're in a, a manager position, they have to be budget-minded. 
They are very service oriented and driven. Again, the competitive nature of who they are. They want to please and they're very good at relationships. That's who they are. That's how they grew up. They're uncomfortable, which I think is interesting. They're uncomfortable with conflict. When you think about it, they were the rebellious crowd against established authority. But still and all now, they're uncomfortable with conflict. They're overly, or can be, overly sensitive to feedback, which means I believe I did a good job. I don't want to hear I didn't do a good job. They can be concerned about participation and the spirit at work. And they, this goes back again to who they are, the first ones to believe in causes. They want to bring heart and humanity to the workplace. Now, Generation X is, <clears throat> again, think of these numbers up here, 63 to 80, a little bit fluid. Smallest generation in the recent past. Why is that? Because, again, the boomers had less children. When you're looking at the traditionalists and the older group, the soldiers, those families had many more children to perpetuate the family, to work, to help on, you know, if they lived on farms or whatnot. Boomers learned from those parents, but they had less children. So when the boomers did have children, they had much less. So the boomer families had maybe two or three. What does that mean? So the generation Xers, there are not as many in those families as there are in the boomer families and the traditionalists, definitely the traditionalists. Now in the generation Xs, their mothers left home for the workplace. So here's where the juggling started with these kids. So these kids learned how to be very self-reliant, sort of raise themselves. And very often you will hear the oldest in the families talk about how they raised the younger ones. There's little structure and they learned early on what daycare or what home care was. This crowd is technologically adept. They were the first ones to really start getting into it. They don't have heroes. They're born skeptics because they are absolute survivors. They changed the cities, the homes, and how they parent. These kids grew up with being latchkey kids. So they came home from school. Again, mom may not be there. So as a latchkey kid, you knew how to live on your own. You knew to come in, do your homework, etc. So they learned, be careful out there, the Brady Bunch. And they still say, some of them, get a life. So there's, again, all this sort of social structuring for them. But keep in mind, Generation Xs are in the workforce now. And that skepticism can sort of permeate in a workforce. Generation Xs. They're comfortable with change. They're extremely resourceful. They can avenue almost anything. They're non-traditional to orientation time and space because they were the first in the technology. They like an informal work environment. This is the crowd that likes to work at home. Casual approach to authority. You know, to the soldiers and the traditionalists, what was Mr. Jones becomes to the Generation X is, good morning, Jim. So it isn't good morning, Mr. Jones, it's good morning, Jim. This crowd can also be brutally honest. And they were the first ones to say that they can't remember a time when politics, leaders, business, and authority figures are not tainted by corruption. They have a great need for flexibility and balance. And this crowd yearns for family, friends, and fun. Remember, they grew themselves up a lot on their own. So they're very family oriented. They want. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, millennials. Again, please be aware the numbers can be fluid. Learned early on, it takes a village. These kids don't raise themselves. You have a lot of people sort of bonding together to help much larger generation than Generation Xers, helicopter parents, technology natives. This is the group when you don't know how to do something and work, you can go right to a millennial and find out, or your granddaughter or grandson. 
they don't have barriers really of time and space. They feel they have just about seen and heard everything. When in reality, this is one of the collisions that happens with traditionalists. So that if you have the soldiers traditionalists who live through a more difficult period of time, as they see, i.e. the World War II or the parents that lived through it, you know, they see, this is where the collision, they see it very differently. They see the work back then is much more difficult. Where in reality, millennials think the world today is very difficult. So millennials grew up with Baby on Board, Beanie Babies, Oprah and Rosie, and the X Games. What helps for them? When you have millennials in the workplace, one of the things you really want to look at is creating a strong teamwork ethic. They're very goal-oriented. They love opportunities to train and learn. They don't really get into a lot of gender, age, and role issues. They love being mentored. Communication with them is instantaneous and it's very impersonal. It's about being connected. It's about being in touch. What's important and how millennials will work is if you give them a task and you sit them at tables, sit them at round tables, and give them a task, one task, this table, do it. And you give traditionalists that same task over here at the table. You have two different styles. The millennials will respond immediately to that type of work. Your traditionalists are uncomfortable with that. The traditionalists want to be told what to do. I see that in the work of education. It trickles right down in the world of education. When you're teaching, if you're an educator, when you're teaching, the traditionalists will sit what we call theater style and take notes. Millennials will sit at tables. They like to interact. They're clicking, they're taking pictures. And it's very different for them. They will interact at a table much easier. Whereas your, your different age brackets who are older over here, sit better, learn well in theater style and don't do well with what we're doing right now. <laughs> more, more communication patterns. This was really interesting to me because the traditional go across the top, traditionalists, baby boomers, exes and millennials, the style of them, traditional, formal, semi-formal, not so serious. And millennials live, they love fun. So go down the bottom. The attitude of traditionalists are accepting and trusting of authority and hierarchy. Very rarely ever question anything. And they like communication to be in prose and writing, written. I want to give me an email on that or a written letter by, e by mail. Baby boomers, just chunk it down for me. What do I need to know? What's the bottom line? I accept the rules because I grew up from the traditions. Generation X's, get to the point. Tell me what I need to know. I don't need all of that whole letter. You know, is there four bullets out of this that I need to know? Give me the bullet points. Relevance to what matters to me. Openly question authority. Again, these are the people who have that sort of lax view of the world with authority. It's the high gym mentality. All the branded as skeptics and cynics. Millennials love anything that's eye-catching and fun. If I need to learn it, I'll find it online. But right now, I don't need that. The relevance to today and my role. And the other thing you need to know is that they're okay with authority if that authority has earned their respect. They really need to know about how the, the relationship with that, that authority figure is. Do I respect them? That's key with the millennials. Again, traditionalists, they like print, they like conventional, small amounts. What do I need to know to do my job better? Baby boomers, print face-to-face, -face, emails preferred, text me, available when I need it. Generation Xs online, some face-to-face, -face, mostly technology, social media, internet, whenever I need it. Millennials are continuously, seamlessly connected online and wired constantly. Generation, 
you know, here's what retention, when we talked about retention, soldiers, satisfaction of a job well done, boomers, money, title, recognition, an office is the key issue for status. I made it to an office. Next is freedom and millennials. I just need fun in my life. Traits and a manager, all age brackets want this. They all want to work for a people person. They all want a manager that will support them. Younger generations want to be managed by a team player, you know, who values their participation, who offers praise and recognizes that they have something to be brought because the millennials are so often labeled. The most senior generation in the research that I could find is the only one who mentioned quality, which to me is a concern. But focus on respect is across all generations. So some stresses that you face, you gotta orient people who resist a new system or evidence-based practice. Transitioning a newly graduated professional, whatever profession you're in, who learned a great deal online, who may be fearful of, do I really feel like a competent practitioner? Maybe people attended variable types of programs, all with different backgrounds. Edu have to educate a professional who has more degrees than you, and they certainly let you know. How do you motivate staff that are burnt out, irritable, and grouchy? And then look at their age bracket and try to figure this all out. Resentment from your staff who might want to see your view as cushy and elitist because you're a manager. And trying to teach younger staff, this is a whole other discussion, but the dangers of social media and healthcare. Because social media is so accepted within this age bracket. You have to look at this. What is it that we do? Do we have this type of thinking? Where do we fit in the, the age culture here? Do we take care of ourselves? Do we neglect ourselves? Are we weary and tired? Millennials by the numbers. When you're looking at millennials, you know, technology use is what makes their generation unique. This crew, when you look at the age bracket of what they know, of how they know it, they are unique with their ability to be so seamlessly connected. 43% of the 18 to 24 year olds say that texting listen to this, it's just as meaningful as an actual conversation with someone over the phone. So they think that texting someone or just even across the table texting is acceptable. Millennials think that blogging about workplace issues ex is acceptable. You know, putting it out there, who said what in the workplace. And think about this, work is you know, millennial workers think meetings to decide on a course of action is efficient, as opposed to 45% of boomers. And again, email usage among different age brackets changes as more people come into the workforce who are younger and younger. This is a profound statistic. By 2025, 75% of the workers in the world will be millennials in the world. So I just wanted to think about how, you know, will you still be in the workplace? And how will you interact with people who will be millennials and generation 2020 coming in? And how seamlessly connected will not just generation 2020 be, but coming up beyond that? In short, it's going to be a very different world. And we need to stay current. You need to accept people for who they are and take care of yourself so that you are aware of how you can address this. Not just if you're a manager, but if I'm working alongside different people in different age cultures with different presentations and their style, what kind of collisions can happen to me? Just the convictions, the, the bottom line to there to me is continuity is essential to a personal sense of meaning. We need to know that we are respected, that whatever we bring to the workforce is important based on who we are and our own experiences. More stuff for us to know. We need to be aware that we will get upset and being upset 
really doesn't change anything, change anything, but intensify um, the issues and the emotions that happen. Generational attitudes you want to be aware of. You have values, attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors. Patterns are learned. Where do you learn all these patterns? You learn them from your parents, teachers, peers, society, social media, ethics, respect, honesty, and integrity. There's lots of things going on these days in school systems, you know, on the street and the communities. So think about how it is that a young person can overcome so many of these barriers and still achieve it rather than look at what they don't know. How are they able to achieve given all the barriers and things that are put right in their way and still they were able to do it. I say to my students all the time, I don't think I could learn to do what they're doing, how they're learning. I'm more of a concrete learner and I know that and I tell them I respect a great deal how they learn. Now here's another important statistic. I think I said this, 4.4 years, and that's from the U.S. Bureau of Labor. So just think about 4.0 years. Do you want to last longer than that yourself in a work, in a position? Or if you're a manager or executive or administrative, do you want to keep people longer than that? I think that's the goal, the goal for all of us. How is it we all communicate? If you're older, you want it to be written. Call me is your, the generation X's. Text me, I'm sorry, call me is me, the baby boomers. Email me is your X's. And then your millennials are text me and what's coming. Focus, the important thing here is to focus on what all generations have in common. We all have one goal, really, what is it? To provide exceptional service. And how we do it is based on really, when you think about it, the interactions that we have with each other. So we have to focus on goals. Each generation approaches their work differently. And we have to be aware of that. A key issue in all of this is mentoring and inclusion and not separating people out because they're younger or they're older or they don't understand. Encourage each generation to mentor the other. So one of the things I saw in one um, facility, it wasn't a large facility, is that people who are older, so to speak, and the boomer and there was a, a couple of people in the, the senior bracket, the traditional role, weren't as good with the technology. So they had the younger counselors teaching people how to use different technology that was in the system already. Look at who has trouble with electronic medical records. Who can help best teach? Encourage each generation to mentor the other. And remember the statistic I told you that the older generation was the one that talked about quality? That can be where your older generation helps to mentor the younger. That it isn't a just, just about checkoffs and boxes. That it's about this number, this person is this electronic medical record number that we have to remember that that number means a human being. What that does is break the bonds of tradition and you make all those lines blurry. And the other thing, one young person said to me, I've got some really different ways of thinking. Why won't people listen to me? So I put it right in here. If there's a better way to do it, take the suggestion. So the silent generation, take a look at what they offer, which is hard work to maintain the job. Oops, I'm sorry. Baby boomers, too much time's off. time off means you're gonna lose your place on the ladder. Generation X's are, are fitting up there with the baby boomers and they just want time off so that they can maintain their work-life balance. And the millennials, they just want flex time and job sharing. Traditionalists, this is how they see over here, the strategies. Use them as mentors. Use them in the workplace for how best to teach other generations about quality of care. Boomers, give them public recognition. This is what they thrive on, opportunity to, opportunities to share what they know. They're good preceptors also. And promote gradual retirement, which means maybe a four-day work week. Xers. They're looking for career advancement, but they also like autonomy, 
and independence, work-life balance, provide opportunities for their skill development. Let them be the leaders that they are born leaders. These are kids that raise themselves. They are born leaders in the workplace waiting to just be who they are. This crowd also resists micromanaging. Millennials, if it's meaningful, they're there. They will be your best employee if they believe this is meaningful work. They're impatient for promotion. They wanna move up or they're gonna move out. So the belief system is that, well, I've worked a year. Can I apply for this management position? Whereas if you ask a traditionalist that, they're just, that crowd says, pay your dues. You gotta be here 10 years before you should apply for that. So the millennials, like teamwork. They like a supportive environment. They want to be able to give feedback. They want to be able to tell you, no, that's not how I see it. Flexibility is key with all generations. They, in general, they all want to be able to sort of have some autonomy in the workplace. So this comes from uh, the lawyer who's the head of diversity in Department of Public Health where I work. And one of the things she said is that always remember that anger is a feeling and aggression is behavior. And again, a tip to overcome microaggressions, be aware of your own bias. What is it you think about older or younger? Learn to interact with people from your race, age, generation, abilities, all of these. Learn to not be so defensive. Learn to, you know, when it's, first inherent right there where you want to have a defense statement ready to just sit back and listen, learn to listen more. Be open to discussion and ask questions if you don't know. Micro affirmations are tiny acts of opening doors to opportunity. So when you don't really understand something, ask someone who has that skill. Ask the millennial, can you help me? Can you show me? You're good at this. You're better at this than I am. Over time, the small acts add up to large positive impacts. And just watch. Learn to listen more and watch. Microaffirmations, active listening, pay attention, don't interrupt. Make eye contact, seeing strengths rather than weaknesses reward people for microaffirmations, and especially to those who follow. Be inclusive when it comes to groups, meetings, and events. One of the things I read is pair different age brackets together. So if you have a staff that is all different age brackets, make sure that you pair up different age brackets rather than have all one group over here. And all that does is really create a divide. Nurture friendships, Barry, who was on the project teams, that's a wonderful way to do it also. So Harriet Breaker, Dr. Breaker, the psychologist said, striving for excellence will motivate you. Striving for perfection is demoralizing. This cannot happen in the workplace. And we need to watch our own attitude. This is a wonderful quote about our own attitude is we really have to remember is 10% is what happens to you and 90% how you react to it. And I always give that to different people in all different age brackets. And for all of us, we're not all gonna be famous. It isn't what's engraved in stone monuments. It's what we weave into the lives of others. And I have to tell you, I learn a great deal from the students I work with who are much younger than I am. And when I say to them, I need this, now, there isn't a question of coming back to me in three to four weeks. They are able to do this so quickly. One of them, a group I just had, just created a booklet for men in the program. It was an actual book with quotes and healthcare education and coloring. And it was just an amazing project that they did. I would never have seen that decades ago. It would have taken a long time to complete that project. So I have great respect for their abilities to do. If you mentor them and if you earn their respect, we all have to become active and allow for differences. Each seat at the table has a different view out the window. Embrace the change, it's inevitable, it's going to happen anyways. Recognize each group has a skill to bring to the workplace 
and recognize excellence at any age level and ability and who they are in the culture. They have their own uniqueness and their strengths. Employees should be taught on orientation, the strengths of all generations and how to, a person's each unique knowledge and bring that to the team and create opportunities where someone can, what they learned and how they learned has changed and walked over the years. And I think once we lose the whole process of equality, then we're losing a piece of what our traditionalists have and they have to offer. That being said, um, that concludes my role here today. Um, I would like to just share with you that there will be a poll um, in the, from the webinar. And again, they will ask you questions about the webinar and that will always allow us to um, change and improve what we do. Now, I do have one question. Some of these overall characteristics seem more like the profile of the dominant or white experience. That's a good point. Rather than the minority experience, race, race ethnicity, LGBTQ in the US during these same periods. Could I address some potential overlay of these different experiences on top of the generational descriptors? It's a wonderful question. I mean, when you think about um, the different cultures that people have, have actually lived through, and it, you're probably right. I didn't see anything in the research that said this was specific to the LGBTQ or, you know, people of color. It really didn't break it down that much. And that might be something that I'll dig a little bit more in. But I would imagine that there's a complete variation of what we just looked at on all these graphs based on, you know, a more diverse kind of grouping population. Good point. Okay, there doesn't seem to be um, any more questions. So that being said, um, it's been a joy to be with you. And for the person that did ask that question, um, I appreciate that because that will give me, you know, a way to further enhance this and speak to the people that I work with. Thank you for that. It's been a, a pleasure to be with you. And again, I will provide slides that won't be complete just because of copyright laws. Thank you again.